Hello everyone, my name is John Hammond. Welcome back to the YouTube video, and I am super duper excited to bring this to you. This is a video walkthrough and write-up of the Looking Glass Room on TryHackMe. So let's hop on over to my screen here. I'll show you this. Looking Glass is a challenge room that is a sequel to the Wonderland challenge room, and I still need to give you guys a video on that, so hopefully that can come out soon, maybe tomorrow, we'll see. Uh, but this room is only like less than a week old. Um, I have completed it already, so forgive me for having the user flag and root flag in here. Um, I, I'll, obviously, I'll showcase how to get each of those and what we'll be doing to get through all of those. But I don't think there are any write-ups for this out just yet, so I'm very excited to bring this to you, and uh, let's get to it. I've spun up the machine already, so let's grab the IP address and hop over to our terminal while all the good stuff happens. So I'll start off, as we start off with just about every box, with a classic Nmap scan, TACSC for default scripts, TACSV to enumerate versions, TACON to save into an Nmap format. I'll save it in an Nmap directory that I created in initial being the file name and of course the IP address of this box. So what I normally do while that is running is fire up another terminal and I hop over to see, does this actually have a web page associated with it? So I'll just throw that in, but it looks like there's nothing listening on port 80. Okay, so we don't really have Neato or anything to run or GoBuster or anything we could quick fire off. Uh, what we could do is just maybe try other protocols and see if anything actually responds while we're waiting. Doesn't look like there's anything on FTP. Uh, we could run like enum for Linux or just SMB client to see if there's actually anything there on Samba or SMB port 445. I will promise you there's actually nothing there, but those are the things that I would do while I'm waiting for that Nmap scan to finish. Uh, since this is a video, and I wanted to prove that that I would be running the Nmap scan, I will just pause the video and let that finish, and I'll see you in just a few moments. Okay, our Nmap scan has finished. Uh, that did take a little bit of time to run, so please note that'll take maybe a few minutes. Uh, but let's open it up in Sublime Text to see what we're looking at here. I'll zoom in on this so you can see it. Looks like we have port 22 open with SSH, just a regular open SSH client or server there running on Ubuntu. So we're gonna assume the target is Linux. And we see a lot of other seemingly SSH servers. Oh, there's some weird ones on 900 and up to 903. We can take a look at those manually if we need to, but if you see my mini map over here, there's just a lot of the same entry of like 9,000 up to 13,783. And these are all drop bear SSHD or the SSH daemon or server. So drop bear must be a kind. Um, note here that Nmap only ran it's the most common 1,000 ports. So if we wanted to, we could start an all port scan. And I'll turn off the scripts running here and I'll save that as all ports and I'll let that run while we start to just enumerate and look at some of those oddball ones. Uh, I wanna see that port there. And we have this FTP line. So that already has the IP address and I'll just connect to that. And I get the exact same banner doing a simple banner grab with just netcat connecting to that port. Same thing with 91,000, okay, okay. So we're just seeing a bunch of SSH drop bear. I hadn't heard of that drop bear before, so I had gone to do some research on that. What is drop bear SSH, and are there any like known vulnerabilities or exploits for it? It is a secure shell compatible server. Uh, I would just simply, okay, Google exploit or see if there's anything worthwhile there. And exploit DB had some interesting stuff for remote code execution. Uh, apparently there's some gimmick with like a format string or a printf. And this explanation explained that you needed to use a hacked SSH client to be able to actually trigger that and activate that. I thought that was really weird. Um, but looking at it for the very first time, I had gone ahead and just started to like try to sp supply a username that would actually have that uh, printf format in there. So I would SSH like on a specific port, like 9,000 we knew had that. And I'd specify like a percent %s at that location. Yes, we'll go ahead and accept that key or fingerprint or whatever. And I thought it was weird. It would respond to me with just the word lower. Um, it didn't ask me for a password or anything. So I was like, okay, 
do I need a different like format specifier if I were doing that printf kind of technique? But I would always be responded with lower. And I didn't exactly know what that was or why that was there. Uh, I thought like, okay, is it going to do the same thing on every single port or every single service that had that? So I would try some of the other ones with that 9100 or whatever. Um, but every single time I did this, even without a username specified, if I would just let it use myself, I would just get a response like lower or higher. And for every single other port, I'd have to accept that key. Uh, but you'll notice when I tried one of those other ones, like the top thing that uh, SSH had suggested, this port over here, that would still return some weird message but in this case, it was like higher. And I didn't exactly understand or know why it was saying lower or higher. Um, and when I used a really, really high number, it specified the word higher. And when I used the lower number 9000, which is where I saw the kind of that string and strain of SSH ports open, that would tell me lower. Um, so obviously though, there's, there's a little bit of a, a distinction in between those. If I'm lower or higher, or if I'm too on two either ends of something, uh, maybe I would be narrowing down to actually re retrieve some proper information. Uh, maybe there's one service that is actually what it should be, but I am, maybe I'm too high or I've, I've used a port that's too high as to what it should be when I use this big 13,000 one, or uh, maybe I was too low when I used like a 9,000 port. That was odd and funky to me. So I thought like, okay, let's just simply look at all of these ports. Are they all going to respond the exact same way? So we'd have some wanky, like janky script and loop to literally try and connect to SSH for every single one of those ports. And it might take forever. It might take a way, way, way long time, but we could do it like SSH spam.sh. Let's make a simple bash script where I could show you how that's done. I'll use a for loop. I'll use like port in 9,000 to 13,000 as we saw. Uh, I guess the limit was 13783. Does it go up to like 14,000? Let me try that on the command line. 14,000. Nope, it didn't. But what about 13999? That seemingly will respond, but that once again, tells me higher. Okay, so maybe I would need to be somewhere in this mix. So let's do a simple for loop and I'll use SSH tack P to specify that port and I'll use the IP address, which I can just kind of copy and paste here, slap that in. Obviously, if I were to run this and do this, you might see some interesting problems and predicaments because it's not going to be automated all that well. Uh, sure, we might be able to try a port. Oh, and actually, actually, I should like printf what port we're working on so you can see that output and how far we've moved along in the loop. But notice, obviously, um, whether I get a response lower or higher or whatever the case may be, eventually if I reach a port that I didn't already accept or connect to, I will be prompted to accept this key. And that takes away a lot of the automation <laughs> here. So you could actually supply... I started to memorize this now because I've had to use it so often. Strict host key checking equals no with the TAC O to specify an option for SSH. That way it'll stop you from asking all those silly, annoying things like, oh, do you want to accept this? Um, in this case, yeah, obviously that's a good security thing to do to check. But in this case, yeah, we just kind of want to see what's there. So I would let that run and it would just take gosh darn forever because it's going through however many thousands of ports. Um, and I would always get this response lower from the lower numbers and higher from the higher numbers. So I thought like, okay, if there must be something that I need to be smack dab in the middle on and get the right value, um, I, I thought lower maybe referring to like, okay, network, big endian, because uh, it's, it's an SSH protocol port thing, doing things with networks. Maybe I'm too low when I specify that number. But obviously, I don't know, maybe you would expect to read that in a different way. So let's go back to kind of what we were doing, which is manually connecting to it. But that script could work for us if we just let it run. Maybe eventually we'll get a hit. But if we had the methodology and the thought that, okay, 9,000 was too low, could we try 10,000? And yes, we'll accept that. 
that says higher. Okay, so let me actually do a strict host key, host, strict host key. There we go. <laughs> Set that to no and run that command again. We, we know that this one was higher. So that was too high. So let's do a little binary search because we knew that 9,000 was too low. So we could go kind of in the middle of that and try to see is that 9,500, where is that? Is that too high or is that too low? And that's too high. Okay, so we'll kind of cut that in half. We'll go like 9,200. Is that going to be too high or too low? That's going to be low. So what about... 300 now that we know okay we're sort of finding the sweet spot in the responses that it gives me we know that that one is too high so let's go from 2000 in between excuse me 9200 to 9300 let's go to 50 within that and kind of have that range too high okay let's shrink that down again let's go like 20 and I would use this manual process and it's very annoying and frustrating because it's a little whack-a-mole game, right? But it would at least be a little bit faster and we could automate this process if we really wanted to, but okay. 240 is too high, so let's try 30 because we know that 220 is too low. But I would literally just do this until I kind of found the sweet spot. So 230 is too high and 220 is too low. So let's check out that last digit there with a five, and that's too high. Okay, so let's go to two. Too low. So we gotta be between three and four then. I'll try three, sorry, my face is in the way. But that's too low, so let's try 9,224. We'll find the port, hopefully, 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 that has something real here to return to us. And yeah, okay, cool, we get something super duper new. This says, oh, you found the real service. Solve the challenge to get access to the box. And it says Jabberwocky. But solve the challenge to get access to the box. That sounds kind of promising. Jabberwocky and then seemingly a lot of gibberish and nonsense. And we have to enter a secret. Um, so I looked at this and it's pretty easy to tell, okay, all of, all of these are English letters, right? So... We're at least using the regular alphabet. Uh, maybe this is some substitution cipher or ROT13. So if I took this and maybe I just simply, let, let's make a directory for this like Jabberwock or, sorry, or a file. Slap that in. Let's cat out Jabberwock. So now we've got that on standard output. And let's bring that to ROT13. Still didn't give me anything interesting. Uh, ROT13 is actually part of the BSD games package. So if you're on Ubuntu or a Debian based system, you can get the command line things to do Caesar cipher or other specified key cipher <laughs> with uh, BSD games. Uh, other than ROT13, you could also use Caesar with a specific key specified or a shift value, a number three, four, five, obviously 13 will just be rot 13. I would do this, I would just try each of these and I would put that in a little loop. I'd go zero to 26 or like one to 26. I'll do a done and then a, a do and done here and specify that iterator. Um, what's the issue for I in, excuse me. Okay, and I would have all of the possible rotations or rot 13s in there, but that still didn't particularly give me anything good. So, okay, it's not a rot, it's not a rotation cipher. Um, but what else could it be? Another thought that I would have if I'm looking at something that doesn't look like obviously readable English, but it we know that it's using English letters, it may be a, a simple substitution cipher. And quip quip is really, really great at handling those. So I went to quipquip.com and I'd submit this and see if it would work and it tries its darndest, but it just didn't get it when I was looking at it. Uh, it would it would have a, a couple letters that might have been correct, maybe, but it also had a lot of question marks and things like, hey, I just don't know exactly what I'm looking at. Uh, all this, <laughs> it, it, it couldn't trigger it, it couldn't track it down. So that was not the right route, and I was banging my head against the wall trying to get that right. 
these are just, I, I, I want to showcase like the thought process of the things that I'm trying when I'm encountering this thing that I don't know what it is. My other thought was that, okay, still English letters. Maybe this is a, another classic cipher thing. Maybe a, a Beaufort cipher or a Vigneer cipher. Vigneer, Vigneer. I never pronounce that right and the internet yells at me. So I would search for Vigneer cipher. And I'd throw this into just decode.fr. That's kind of a simple cheesy one. Um, I think my geocaching profile, that's a website that also does a good job here. And I would try like, okay, knowing a key, like I don't know a key. It, this thing was labeled Jabberwock when I looked at it. So maybe Jabberwocky is, is what we just supply here and I could specify decrypt, but that didn't seem to get anything. When I was just clicking around in here, uh, I just let it try to do an automatic decryption and see if it could figure anything out. And suddenly I noticed that it, it, it did figure out a key on its own. It said the alphabet cipher, it's kind of hard to read there, but that is the key that it, it seemed to use. If I paste that in, I wonder if it'll get it just right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that reads it out totally fine. It says twas Brillig and the Slithy Toves did Geyer and Gimble in the Wabe. Uh, I don't know what any of that might be, but at the end here it says your secret is beware the Jabberwock. All right. So let's save this. Just have a copy of it. I'm just going to say uh, decoded Jabberwock. And because there are a lot of moving pieces and parts of this room, we could probably get started with a little readme or whatever. And whatever secret. Uh, or found port 9227 to be real service. Um, received cipher that was Vigneer cipher. I can type with key the alphabet cipher and got secret beware the jabberwock there we go okay so if we needed to actually interact with that ssh service and supply that secret maybe that will work better for us now connect to it and there it is okay so enter secret i'll paste that in shift control v and we get a response jabberwock faces a glow affectionate rocked um now, for some of you that have already worked through this room or you've tried to take a look at this, uh, I will tell you that this changes. The port that you will find this little puzzle on and you'll have to supply the secret does change. And that can be really, really frustrating, especially as you do some of the later parts in this machine. So we've got some credentials, but consider these kind of temporary. But with that said, now we might be able to connect to just a regular SSH port with this credential, Jabberwock, with his password. And I copy that, connect to it, slap that in, and there we go. Okay, we've got access to the box temporarily, right? Let's check out what we've got in here. We have a user.txt, user.txt, great. Um, this key looks to be reversed because you can see the MHT or THM backwards. So you could pretty easily correct that with just rev, piping it to rev, and now you've got the proper key. And that's what you would go ahead and submit for this here. Okay. So now we would like to do some regular enumeration, right? We can sudo tag L. Uh, Looks like the Jabberwock can reboot the server. <laughs> cool. That's kind of interesting and peculiar. There are obviously some other files in here. Poem.txt. And that looks like the exact same poem that we saw when we connected. So what is this Twas Brillig script in here? Oh, it just, <laughs> it walls the poem to everyone that's logged in. That's really funny. Cool. Um, but it's a shell script, right? That's kind of interesting that it's just in his home directory and that there's a shell script that will seemingly do stuff. Um, why would this be here? We can do some other enumeration to find out. Uh, to speed that up, I will just fire up Gwake 
so I can use some of my cheesy poor man's pen test and like upload. Actually, you know what? Let's get Pwncat in here because uh, people always tell me that they'd like to see some Pwncat. So I added a simple uh, Pwncat.sh script in my poor man's pen test sort of functionality here just so I have a quick and easy trigger to activate that. Working directory, it's gonna put me in my clone repository of Pwncat and activate my virtual environment and then go ahead and run Pwncat listening on a given port with a data Pwncat RC file. So I will then just run a simple reverse shell with bash and that should work. So let me try and see if I can get that to work. Pwncat.sh. We funneled that up and that failed. It probably didn't have enough time to get it. There we go. Now Pwncat's up and running. I'll zoom that in and I'll make this a dark text background so we can kind of make sense of where we are. Does he actually ever get a host name? Oh, it's backgrounded. Let me foreground that. That command, I've been trying to figure out what I could do to like spawn a reverse shell and then continue the operation in that original shell. Uh, it's weird to do that because obviously you would, just, if you wanted a Pwncat shell or session, you would just start off with that. And Pwncat, I think, can SSH, but I've been having some funky issues with it. Um, I might just not have the like proper libraries or things needed, but okay, we're Jabberwock. There we go. Okay, let's, uh, let's go ahead and switch to our local prompt here and let's upload a local file. I have linpeas stored in my op directory, so let's upload that. Uh, linpeas, excuse me, .sh. There we go. I'll zoom in on that. Kind of screws up <laughs> that little uploader. But now if I hop back to Jabberwock, we do have a linpeas.sh file. So let's go ahead and run linpeas. You could do enumeration uh, just with Pwncat itself. Like Pwncat has an enum functionality that is meant to do a lot of the enumeration that linpeas already does and still be smart about it and use it uh, with its own privilege escalation techniques and other interesting things. Uh, it's slow on a target, but I can show you like, okay, if you do enum tag show tag a or something, it'll start to enumerate things, but this might take a while, especially when you're going through whatever VPN connection. Uh, and it'll start to look for stuff. If I give it a little bit more time, without boring you too much, it will like, okay, look for cron tabs and there we go, look for set UIDs and capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. But it won't show you at all until it's kind of done, which isn't an issue, but there should be some other stuff that we want to do. So that's a thing. Uh, let me stop it. Okay, there, <laughs> I lost that pwn cat. Let's do that one more time. We'll just connect to it again. There we go. Maybe I was too quick. Okay. And now he's going to make his connection running in bin bash and let's make that dark cool okay back in jabberwock uh let's go back to his home directory we already put linpeas there so let me just run linpeas i'm sorry for for beating around the bush let's speed that up here we go Linpeas might take a while to run also but looks like we have a old pseudo version maybe we could kind of abuse that what do we got? CPU, environment, nothing particularly stands out. Linpeas does a really good job of like color coding the stuff that's interesting. Oh, and that just died. Oh, you know what? That's probably because of all of the listening ports and Netstat will return that. So let's just do it through the SSH session. I'm sorry. Let, let's, let's capture that, save that output. We're taking our time here, guys. There's a lot to unpack here. Okay. What is this? What section is this? This is a cron tab. It's a cron jobs. So looking through everything that we saw earlier, we have some interesting software. LXC is in here for containers. That's kind of peculiar. And we have a compiler. Maybe that will come in handy at some point for some reason. Binary process is running. PS. Looking at cron jobs, a lot of these look as they should, but one down below has an interesting note here. Upon reboot, the Tweedledum user 
will run that Twas Brillig script. Oh, and we have control over that because that's in our home directory. Okay, so that way we could at least move into that Tweedle dumb user because we can control that code and maybe we can make it come back to us. Uh, that's a thought. Let me keep looking through this before we forget to. And there's a lot here, obviously. Nothing immediately stands out with the color coding. Oh, gosh. And <laughs> all of these netstat entries, all the listening ports. Let me turn on the scroll bar and, and zoom right on past all of that output. Holy cow. That's a lot. Okay. Okay. That's enough. Are we done yet? Oh, my gosh. Okay, we're at the end. <laughs> there we go. My user is Jabberwock. As we know, no PGP keys. I'll resuit or attack L output. Linpeas.sh. Oh, this is like an error. And I've seen this a little bit in Linpeas. It's weird. It it like tr it it trips up on the suitors.d readme file. Um and I don't know why, but it's actually, I think, kind of a good thing because it reminds me to go check out that directory where some things might be able to hide. So I'll take a look at some of those if I can, I guess. Users with console. There are a lot of users. We have Humpty Dumpty, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, of course, a Trihackme user, and Alice. Sorry, I almost forgot about Alice. A lot of users to work through. Oh, boy, we are in for a treat. Okay. Alice seems to be logged in. That's funky. And Trihackme's logged in. Wait, is that last logins? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so some time ago. And almost done, I swear. I know this is like probably the most boring thing for you. No seemingly weird set UID binaries. At least right now. Remember when we're running LinPs, we're only running it from the perspective advantage point of our current user. So Jabberwock doesn't have a whole lot that he can do seemingly other than his reboot. He can pseudo reboot. He can actually reboot the box. And we know that cron job will fire off as the Tweedledee or Tweedledum user, whichever one that was that would actually execute code that he has control over. Okay, so that's fine. Now that we have that game plan, Remember pseudotech L. Oh, and before I forget, I do want to check out pseudoers.d. I can get in there and we can cut out the readme file. I can't cut out the readme file. Can I cut out myself? No. Can I cut out Alice? Whoa. I can cut out Alice. Alice Salg Gnuk? That's that's looking glass backwards. Oh, and that must be specifying it for the host. And he can just run as root bin bash. Okay, so it looks like Alice is like the keys of the kingdom, right? If we get into Alice, then we're good. Peculiar. Um, okay, okay, good to know. What else did we have in there? We had Tweedles. Tweedles, can I read those? Nope, I can't. Whatever, let's get back to our mission here to modify our Twas Brillig and go ahead and get a connection back as the Tweedledum or Tweedledee user. Before I do that, I know this is gonna come to bite me because as I said, it will change like the port that you connect to with and, and the password specifically for this Jabberwock user. So before I go crazy, let me try and make another SSH connection to this machine. Jabberwock at this thing. Well, I'm gonna have to reboot it, so that wouldn't work either. Gosh, I hate this this gimmick. <laughs> You're killing me with this gimmick. Is that password still there? Is that still the right password currently, or did it change on me? Because I know it does. Okay, good. That still works. Uh, regardless, we need to modify our Twas Brillig script. Twas Brillig. So let me just have Pwncat listen on a specific port and I'll slap that in with my current address and 21564 will be the port that we use. Okay. So we could just 
run that upon reboot. And since we can reboot, it will work. So let me spin this up, make that black and let that listen. And let's try to, let's, let's just remove this session because we're gonna have to stupid reboot the box, which is a weird uh, sensitive thing to do. And let's ping him. Actually, sorry, let's reboot first. Pseudo reboot, and it requires no password. He's doing it. Now let's start to ping. And in a little bit, we should see our pings come back online and we should see a connection from our listener. Uh, I realize this output's really, really wonky because I zoomed in, so I'm sorry about that. But you can still see uh, Rich with his nice little loading bar. That's kind of nice and fancy. All right, I will pause just a moment and see when this comes back online. Oh, okay, there are pings and we've got our connection. Okay, great. Pumpcat's running in bin bash. Setting up our prompt. And we are the Tweedledum user. All right. Where are we? We are just in the root directory. Let's go home. And we have Humpty Dumpty.txt and poem.txt. Let's check out poem.txt. Tweedledee and Tweedledum agreed to have a battle. Oh, this is just another silly poem from like Alice in Wonderland stuff. Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> Let's see what that has. Humpty Dumpty, that looks like just hex nonsense. Are these hashes? How long are these? Echo that into your word count, tack count. 65, okay. Well, no, because that's not, oh, that is including the new line. So maybe that's a hash, whatever. Let's cat that again. Um. Oh, this one's funky. This looks like ASCII or like the six, the sheer amount of sixes and sevens makes me think that this is just going to be like actual English <laughs> or X stuff. That's a real thing. Uh, let me try that. Let me cat uh, Humpty Dumpty again. And let me XXD tack R tack P to like unhexlify all that. So the Oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. the top stuff is nonsense, but the bottom part has a password. The password is that thing. And what is it a password for? Is that a password for Humpty Dumpty or myself? Do I, can I pseudo attack L? Uh, ooh, I can get into Tweedledee because I'm Tweedledum right now. No password been bash. Okay, so we have two things going. Uh, let me just jot this down. Humpty Dumpty's password. Maybe, or whatever. We found that in Humpty Dumpty.txt. Let me see if I can get into Tweedledee. So I'll pseudo tack you to specify that user, and then I'll run that to bin bash, and there I am. Okay, I'm Tweedledee. Can I do anything interesting as Tweedledee? I can get right back into Tweedledum. <laughs> okay, what's in, what's in their home directory? Oh, I, it doesn't think that that's set right now, so I'll have to go to home. Tweedledum, Tweedledee, Tweedledee. That's the current user that I am. And we have Humpty Dumpty and poem.txt. The exact same, literally identical Tweedledum. Fantastic, useless, great. Um, let me exit out of that. Let me go back to Tweedledum and let me try that Humpty Dumpty password. Can I SU to Humpty Dumpty? Try this password. Yes. Okay, cool. So that gets you in as Humpty Dumpty. And Tweedledee and Tweedledum might have been able to like see more in the file system. Maybe, maybe they had access to some set UID binaries or, or set group ID stuff. So they would be worthwhile to run LinPs on that as well. Um, but we could do it as Humpty Dumpty just as easily. Can I SSH into Humpty Dumpty because I have his password? Like SSH... Humpty Dumpty at, gosh, why do I always lose this IP address every single time? Slap that in, this location and his password. No, 
Very weird. I have his password, but I guess just he... Wait, is that public key? Did that say public key? Am I just not allowed to log in as a password with him? No, it's just permission denied. Okay, whatever. Um, let me set my prompt back. Tech Tech Fancy. What can Humpty Dumpty run as root? Did I check that already? We have his password. Humpty Dumpty may not run sudo. Okay. <clears throat> what was in his home directory? Poetry? Poetry.txt? Oh, gosh. What is this? You seem very clever at explaining words, sir. Said Alice. Okay, Alice is in play. And then Jabberwocky. Let's hear it. Is there going to be like steganography in here? Is there going to be like something funky and weird? Are there... Like I could download this. Let me download uh, poetry.txt. There we go. Where am I? Oh, I'm just in the in the home directory or in a, in the repository of Pwncat. Whoops. I guess that makes sense, right? There's no like extra tabs or spaces in here. I don't know what that could be. Whatever. Okay, maybe that's a lost cause. Mm. Okay. So enough acting at this point. Um, I was stuck on the Humpty Dumpty user for so long, like I had no, I, I could not track down what the heck to do. Um, while I was just bumping around the file system, like I would run linpeas again, I would run linenum again. Um, when I went back to take a look at the users and to see like, oh, would I be able to actually move into any of these other directories? Like it was weird to me because I could tell that Jabberwock was able to be accessible from like everyone because Linpeas and Linenum would always see files within Jabberwock and it would know that it could see them. And that was just weird. Uh, so I took a look in the home directory and I noticed a really weird thing where Alice, this, this other user Alice, has her home directory executable by everyone. Uh, so when a directory is executable, that means you can actually move into it. But if it's not readable, you can't read anything in there which is really weird and funky. Uh, so I would try to move into Alice and I could be there, but I couldn't actually read anything in there. I, I couldn't see any files. Uh, but a weird leap of faith, weird thought. And it, it took me forever to friggin' come to this. And I, uh, I owe all the shout outs and kudos to the people that were like helping me kind of bump ideas back and forth. Uh, if we're looking to their home directory and SSH is a thing, maybe we can access that SSH IDRSA or their, or their private key. So I thought, let's go ahead and try inside her home directory. Let's check to see if we can her, see her private key. And we can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, if I like try and ls this, it's a thing. I can ls tag l this. Apparently, that private key is just owned by me, owned by Humpty Dumpty. Because I thought like, well, why why did I not see that, or was I was there a reason I couldn't see that as Jabberwock or as Tweedledee or Tweedledum? And Tweedledee and Tweedledum were like a weird rabbit hole in themselves because they could just circle back into each other with their pseudo privileges, but. Alice's SSH key is apparently just owned by Humpty Dumpty. It's owned by this current user. So regardless, we have a private key. I'm scrolling up way too high. So let's grab this. Uh, let me just slap that into like a Alice ID RSA file. And then let's hop on over to it. YouTube looking glass and let's SSH tack I Alice IDRSA Alice at the IP address and see if we can log in. Oh, I need to mark that as hours and hours alone. So chmod 600, try it again. Boom. Now we're Alice. <laughs> okay. So we got that user and we 
remember with some of our previous enumeration, if you were to check out that pseudoers directory, Alice has her own file that once again, for some reason we could read. So Alice just has, seems to have weird permissions. Uh, but note, like if I were to try and pseudo tag L, it would need a password and that wouldn't work. So I wouldn't be able to see that with pseudo tag L because I don't know Alice's password. But we were able to find it and see it within etc. pseudoers and that Alice file. Weird gimmick though, they set this. They set this issue where you are using a different host name for sudo rather than it would normally be. So if I were to sudo bash, it would need a password. So it's not triggering this uh, no password setting because we aren't at the right host name. Right now we're at looking glass and not looking glass backwards or that mirror, right? The reverse of it. So what do I do here? How can I fake the host name? Uh, I tried to Google this a little bit. I was like sudo fake host name and how to change the abode, like the host name. These are all things you could do and like modifying et cetera hosts or et cetera host name. And I tried to see like, okay, can I actually modify that file? I have permission denied on reading or writing on that. And that didn't work. Pseudo command trying to search for host name. Set a host name CTL. I couldn't modify hosts. Same thing in it set host name. Still unwritable. That would not work. And I'd have to reboot, right? And I don't know if that change would actually take effect. So I would do a lot of research for this and it, and it took me a little bit, but then the answer kind of came to me sudo with different host name. I have, I'll look through some of my previous research to see where the solution actually popped up. I think it's here. Yeah, 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 it's right here. The sudo command can actually take a host name parameter. So you can just straight up specify that. Like you don't need to do any hardcore crazy things to modify it. Uh, like the real legitimate machine host name, you can just simply sudo tack h and that looking glass in reverse and then try and run bin bash. And there you go. Your root. That's it. Now you've now you've rooted the box. Right? Cat root.txt. There we go. Rev that again for that nice gimmick. And you could slap that in and get your points. So that was that. Interesting room, interesting things here. What is this, the end file? I don't think I actually uh, took a look at some of these. Nice. I like the Alice in Wonderland theme. I thought that was very cool, kind of fun and clever. What are these passwords that we've got here? Pass generator. Oh, as you can probably see, like how uh, Jabberwock had his password reset or changed for some of you that might've been struggling with that. I know I was when I was going through it, passwords.sh. Yeah, pass generator to try hack me password. And they would, they would just apply it to Jabberwock. Gosh, dang. So weird things, right? Let me let me explore a little bit more and kind of showcase this if, if you're totally cool with it. I know we're on a long video and it's gonna be even longer. Um, Alice, I noticed that she has that weird directory and I was so confused. Why couldn't I read that or why couldn't anyone else read that uh, IDRSA key, any other users? So moving into Alice's home directory, oh, she has a kitten file. <laughs> I never really showcased that, whatever. But her .ssh directory still executable. People can move into that and this .idrsa is owned by Humpty Dumpty. Very weird, interesting misconfiguration. Uh, so I was thinking like, how could I have ever remembered or thought or made myself actually so see that leap of faith or be able to, to take that and know to go there? Other than, oh, I see that Alice's home directory is very weird with, a, with an executable bit on it. Uh, that tipped me off to it, but how do I make sure that I will, will catch that in the future? So let me deviate and actually go back to some Pwncat stuff, um, just because I want to be able to know how to make this better and make me smarter. So for those of you that just wanted to walk through for this room, 
that's the end of the video. I hope you guys enjoyed. I, I, I think there were really interesting and cool tricks for, for rooting this box and some fascinating gimmicks and stuff to, to stumble on and trip over. But I hope you enjoyed and I hope you learned a thing or two. That pseudo tack H trick is kind of neat. Um, okay. To seeing how we could smartly determine Alice's private key, um, I go to I go to Pwncat, right? Because this is how we're trying to weaponize or automate some Linux red team operations or things. And how could we track down this private key? So if you take a look at Pwncat.read the docs, Pwncat is the uh, labor of love project that I've been working on with my with my good friend Caleb Stewart, and it's on GitHub. If you have any interest in this tool, GitHub. Caleb Stewart, Pwncat. There you go. You can play with it and tinker with it, but we're trying to do some more interesting things with it because we might end up making it look like a little bit more of a metasploit methodology and trying to run some things or communicate with some things. But uh, Pwncat is supposed to smartly be able to understand the victim or the target or what you've connected to. Uh, with that, it could do enumeration. It can automate privilege escalation for simple set UID or pseudo password stuff. Uh, and it, it's also really just a great thing to have working alongside you for easy upload and download and transfer C2, XFIL, whatever. There's a lot you can do with it because you can automate and script on the victim without ever being on it before. And that's kind of neat. Um, so I had the thought because Pwncat has some enumeration. Like it will try to enumerate the same way that uh, LinPs will, and it has different providers or types of things to enumerate and look for to, to do that, to actually make that happen. So I would run enum tag T, and if I tab complete, you can see some of the things that it could look for. Look for file capabilities, cron tab, fstap, maybe some kernel exploits that Lin, like, I don't know, the Linux exploit suggester might showcase or the screen version or the process is running or the private keys or pseudo set UID. There, there's a lot of stuff it could look for and, and uncover and find. The user private key is the original thing that you would see if you're actually still working with Pwncat and you're tinkering with it. Uh, let me actually show that and see if it can dig it up or track it down. This user Humpty Dumpty does not have a private key, right? So let me uh, start to, let me SU to Alice. And I'm, I'm kind of going off script here right now, right? Like, Let me run that one more time. My timing was probably just a little too quick. Make that black one more time. So I'm running as Alice right now once Pwncat starts up. And I could run that enumeration one more time. So let me simply enum user private key to see what we've got. And it hopefully would, okay, apparently just not find her private key or long. Nope, not gonna show it, fine. That demo was useless. Incredible. <laughs> so let's look at what else we could do because that would just look for a private key that that user owns. And since Alice doesn't own her private key, apparently, maybe it's just not going to showcase. What I wanted to do was I wanted to write something where you would look through all of the home directories and just check to see, can you read that user's home directory? Their, and their SSH private key. Is that going to exist? Will that work? So I took a look at Pwncat's code and I recommend you kind of doing this as well if, if you would like to tinker with it, if you're interested in that sort of thing. You can download, clone the repository, work with it. But Pwncat is nice in that its victim module has a lot of information already stored about what it's, what it's really working with. So there's a section here, the victim object, and you can simply search for like users and it actually has in the victim object an understanding of what users are available on the target. Return a list of users, the local database cache. If users have not been requested, this will call victim reload users and reload users will search and find those and get all that info. So I had a disconnect. Oh, let me just get a regular shell. Sorry. CD get pwncat. Inside of Pwncat source code, obviously there's a Pwncat directory. The enumerate directory has providing scripts and code that will work for an actual uh, enumeration provider or a type or what you're actually looking for. So there was originally private key, and I'll show you this. Private key would work with a 
function enumerate that will do the thing that you are trying to automate. And it will store and return and keep track of all the information that it finds as what are known as facts. And this is a private key fact. So what this would do is it would look with grep to see anything that looks like a private key that has that syntax in common directories like home, etc. And it would run stat on them. And stat's pretty nice because it's actually like, I don't, is stat pretty well known? Or is, stat's not a built-in. What is, okay, yeah, it's a binary, but it's pretty common just about everywhere. So it would read all this information out and then it would grab like by running this command, stat on a specific file. I, cr I, I tested this locally on um, a syslog account. So I would stat home syslog.ssh idrsa. And it would tell me, okay, that user that owns it and the path there. Those are the format specifiers uh, that these arguments are being used for. So that's how that original one worked. It would grab the UID of the user and the path. So the path would then be enumerated and returned as a fact, and it would return with this private key object. They're kind of to denote that. And I thought like, let's tinker with this. Let's recreate this. Let's have uh, another private keys enumeration file that will do um, stuff, not just looking in these directories, but trying to check in every single user's home directory what their actual, uh, SSH key like permissions and privileges are. Can we read that private key just by looking at all those home directories and seeing if we can just cat that out? Maybe a little brute force. So I wrote that and it, it's just a slight tweak to what this code already does. Um, what I would do is I would look through the username and user data in this victim users dictionary because it'll have a username and then the, the user object that actually has some information. And there's a home directory property inside of that user data object. So what I would do for every single username, I would stat all of this out and see if in their home directory, I could read their SSH ID RSA. And to just read it as we did previously and append that to a list where I'm grabbing the username UID path. Uh, I added the username as an element here. So when it's read out into the source, and, and displayed to you, you can work with it just fine. And then we try and import the private key to make sure it's a real thing, but read all the content as we need to. So that's a thought. Uh, this can be made better, and I still need to do this by combining the stat command into just one stat command. That will be a lot faster. And uh, let me, let me, can I try that? I really want to. Let me, all right. <laughs> let's let's go into uh, unknown territory here. Let's grab the user data home for each of these in a list. Oh, I I want yeah user data home der. I don't I don't ever use this variable. <laughs> That's funny. So stat. Or no, 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 no. It's going to be user data home data for each of those. So let's just say a space to join all of those because that's going to take the place of stat here because you can supply multiple. Can you not? Um, it's at hosts, I guess. There you go. Okay, yeah. So just as another argument in there. So we're putting all those together as priv keys and then we don't need this loop anymore and we can stat f priv keys so now we'll have a list joined together of all the user home directories for the usernames that it finds um, and we actually don't even really need that oh no now we don't have the username If I specify the UID, let's just do UID. And then we won't need to specify. Oh, do we ever even use that? We did not. I removed UID. 
sorry, I'm just, <laughs> again, this is the disclaimer of me going into unknown territory is that I will uh, self.uid, which is passed, good. And we'll stat all of those private keys and we'll read them all. So that might be a little bit faster. So it's just one command ran rather than multiple. And this could obviously be made even faster by only looking for files or only looking for users that have an actual shell that they'll interact with. Because obviously if you're looking at like root users, sys, log, games, or mail, that's not, or nobody, that's not going to have a, an actual thing to SSH into. So that would be a waste of time to, to look for. But maybe that, will work so okay anyway that's how i've been reading and just getting that data by looking in their home directory and .ssh idrsa and we can make that a little bit faster but the idea would be to have this utility so that uh let me get a su humpty dumpty Let me kill this, let me kill this, let me kill this. Oh, okay. Let's just fire up Pwncat with Humpty Dumpty one more time. There we go. He's initializing. And because I've saved that script and it's using a local uh, virtual environment that I had created, it should have those changes. So I should be able to show you that. Black and we're Humpty Dumpty, okay. So let me flush my enumeration so far because I don't want the stuff that's stored in the database to showcase it. Obviously, you just want to simply be able to run a showcase everything, like TAC S for show and TAC A to show me all the information that you can find. But as I showcased earlier, that takes a long time. So please bear with me uh, because I'm just going to do some suspended disbelief. Obviously, if you're doing this for real, you want to just run all and just keep doing your manual enumeration, your manual interaction later in a different terminal or somehow, and you would just let that run. You'd let that go to see what information it can find for you. In this case, let me just use a specific type of, of enumeration. We'll use the one that we just wrote, which is system users .private key, and let's see if it could find Alice's or that, that other the the private key for Alice that it found. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. So it found a potential private key for that UID, which we know is is owned by Humpty Dumpty. So that's actually going to be Humpty Dumpty's. We should we should keep track of that username in the code. But we know that that's a thing, and it was able to find it. So if we actually just run tag tag long, it'll just give it'll poop out that RSA private key. That's it. So I'm trying, we're trying to figure out how we can automate some of those things, even when we're doing this sort of thing. Because the me methodology and mentality behind Katana and Pwncat and our other projects is to remind us to, and uh, do the things that we would otherwise forget to do, uh, especially just checking uh, a directory you wouldn't expect as a user to see something that will really, really help you. But okay, wow. That was a lot of me talking. I'm really sorry for all that nonsense, but I hope you enjoyed that little deep dive into Pwncat and what you could do to also write and explore some of the enumeration modules and scripts and code and stuff that you can do. But let's exit out of that. Let's submit our root and let's get our points for Looking Glass. Wow. Let's end the video, guys. We've been talking for a while. Hey, thank you so, so much for watching. I know this was a long, long video and we got into maybe some rabbit holes that we didn't need to get into, but I wanted to showcase everything for you. I want you to be able to kind of see, hey, what I'm what I'm doing, what my thought process is, and what, uh, I don't know, maybe that, that might help you. So. Alrighty, thanks everybody. I love you. If you did like this video, please do press that like button. Please leave a comment. Please do hit that subscribe button, the bell, whatever you'd like to do. I'm really, really grateful. Hope you enjoyed this video. I'll see you in the next one. Take care.